afternoon. Uh, I'm Smarit Zayakovic, I'm an Associate Professor of Humanities and Social Thought at Yahoo. at Longboard University, which is in the neighborhood um, of Chicago. So thank you all for returning from a very uh, pleasant environment with food and, and beverages um, for the last of the sessions of this conference of the, week, the World Catholicism Week, uh, which is entitled Theological Education. Um, just like the format of other sessions, we are going to have three papers uh, in this, uh, on this panel. And after the presentations, we'll open the floor to the questions. Uh, in the first part, we'll uh, open the floor for the questions related to the presentations themselves. And then later we'll have some time perhaps to together to reflect on the topics and themes and questions that emerge from the whole conference. Um, the first speaker is uh, Vaiseta Vargas. She's a member of Augustinian Sisters or Our Lady of Consolation for 44 years. Uh, Sister Naiseta uh, has taught New Testament studies for the past 25, 21 years at the Institute of Formation and Religious Studies and the Loyola School of Theology, both in Kuzen City. Uh, she holds a PhD in Religious Studies with a specialization in the New Testament from the Catholic University of Rouen in Belgium and has various publications on New Testament themes, including the book, Word and Witness, and Introduction to the Gospel of John, which was published in 2013. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My dear daughters and sons of wisdom. <laughs> we are now the last stretch of our conferences, and I promise you this will be interesting. And of course, before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference to Bill, to Francis, and to Karen, and to all who have made it possible for all of us, and especially for me, to come here and share what I have prepared for this research. So we are on theological education, and I entitled my paper, Locating Women in Four Catholic Schools of Theology in the Philippines. So you will now go to the Philippines. Imagine you're going to fly away until you reach the Philippines. That's, you know, actually it took me 40 hours to, to reach this place. <laughs> Including the 13 hours distance of time. Yeah. So the objective of my presentation, to present a profile of students and faculty in four schools of theology. The curriculum, the impact of women faculty on students, and the place of women theologians in the theological formation of future priests, consecrated persons, and lay men and women. So as a background, the Philippines, as you know, is a Catholic country, with 79% of our people registered as Catholics of 2013 statistics. <coughs> of the 103 minor and major seminaries in our country at present that cater to priestly formation, 22 have schools of theology where either or all formal bachelor's, master's, and doctorate programs are offered. Two of the schools of theology are offering ecclesiastical degrees, namely the Central Seminary of the University of Santa, Santo Tomas and the Loyola School of Theology of the Ateneo de Manila. And two institutes are not connected with any diocesan seminary or a college or even a university. That is the Institute of Formation and Religious Studies and the Mary Hill School of Theology. So this is the map of the Philippines. And as you notice there, it is presented in the center. This is the Metro Manila and suburbs and you have the capital of the Philippines here, and one half of the schools of theology <coughs> in the country are found here. So we are all neighbors around. So how about the theological formation of women? And this all started with Vatican II, with the call for a giornamento that awakened the religious women the need and importance of taking theological formation and education. So that in 1963, the Association of Major Religious Superiors of Women in the Philippines founded the Sister Formation Institute. 
to provide for young women religious the most needed and sound academic training and background in theology and spirituality. And there was a growing sense of uneasiness about the education of women religious who really did not get any theological formation for church ministry before Vatican II. So I have chosen four schools of theology as the basis of my information. The first is the Institute of Formation in Religious Studies, which is by the Association of Major Religious Superiors. The second is the Loyola School of Theology by the Jesuits. The third is your sister school, St. Vincent School of Theology. And the last one is the Institute of Consecrated Life in Asia. So why did I choose these? Because I found them to have solid theological formation, but at the same time, they are in dialogue with the world, with interdisciplinary, contextualized, and gender-inclusive vision. So we start with the IFRS, which initially was Sister Formation Institute. In the beginning, we all had women studying in this school, but later on, men, laymen, and some religious men came to attend classes here, so the name was changed to Institute of Formation and Religious Studies in 1995. So it is important to note that this school is a contextual, integrated, inclusive, and transformational vision. This is the vision of this school. And it offers one year certificate program for sisters, and which means that after one year when they leave the school, that is their whole theological formation for all their life. So later on, this school offered the bachelors in religious studies, and so the sisters were encouraged to finish a religious studies degree, and later also offered masters of arts in religious studies for men and women, religious and lay persons who wish to have a solid formation in theology. So in the master's program, IFRS offers the following majors, theology, scriptures, women and religion, and Christian spirituality. This is a distinct identity of this school that women and religion is one of its major um, essential uh, identity. So that's IFRS. The second is Loyola School of Theology. And I, I teach at IFRS and I also teach at LST. So this school intends or is open to any lay, religious, or clerics who desire to pursue graduate studies in theology. And then it says, next, it also provides theological preparation for the priesthood. So in other words, in terms of its goal, it is for inclusive of everyone, and of course, it is offering theological preparation for the priesthood as it offered in the beginning. So its vision and mission states that this institute is dedicated to formative theological education and research within the Catholic tradition as well as to respond to contemporary ecclesial and social concerns. Aims to produce graduates who are academically competent, spiritually well-grounded, and apostolically motivated for Christian discipleship, renewed evangelization, and social transformation, and responsible stewards of the earth. So LST offers the following academic programs. Baccalaureate in Sacred Theology, because this is an ecclesiastical degree program, Masters of Arts in Theological Studies and Pastoral Ministry, Biblical Exegesis, and Licensure in Sacred Theology, Doctorate in Sacred Theology, PhD in Theology, and Doctorate in Ministry. So the third is your school, St. Vincent School of Theology. 
founded in 1985, so it's a young school of theology. But I would say very progressive. This school is an institute for theological, pastoral, and missiological formation of persons for effective service in the church and society. Its vision, mission statement intends to follow, I quote, a way of doing theology that builds on the religious experience, we were talking about that just a while ago, building on the religious experience and praxis of the socially excluded and gears toward the evangelization of the poor. And uh, it speaks here of a theological starting point or locus of this way of theologizing is the human experience that is in the margins or in the frontiers, the privileged place of God's revelation. So this school offers the following degree courses, Doctor of Philosophy in Theology, Masters in Theology with Specialization in Systematic Studies, Moral Studies, Biblical Studies, Liturgical Studies, and Vincentian Studies. Also Masters in Pastoral Ministry. And it also has non-degree diploma courses, namely <coughs> Curriculum for Ordained Ministers, Philosophy Program, and Introductory Theological Formation, Christian Formation for Lay People. And the fourth school of theology that I have included in this research is the Institute of Consecrated Life in Asia. So of the four, this is the youngest, only 21 years old. This, this institute opened its doors as an institute of higher study, so it's for the masters and the doctorate level, in theology and pastoral ministry. It is a center of doing theology to revitalize spirituality and mission in emergent churches, particularly in Asia. As the name um, goes, this is open to different uh, religious congregations and also the clergy and the lay people from Asia. So I call it ICLA in for short, confers Masters of Arts degree in theology with major in consecrated life. So this is the specific identity of this school. Also, major in spirituality, missiology, and biblical ministry. And since this school has an affiliation with the Faculty of Theology of the University of Santo Tomas, it offers an ecclesiastical degree that is licensed and doctoral degree in theology with specialization in consecrated life. So from those four schools, I gathered information, and now I'm summarizing this information that have come. So what is the profile of our students in these four schools? So if you look at the blue and the violet there, this is the male and female um, proportion. You have 60% male and 40% female in terms of population. So this is actually a big growth in the number of female students in the classroom. When I started teaching in 1996, there were very few female students in my classroom at LSD. But now, there are more female students. And I think the big number also comes from the Institute of Formation and Religious Studies because it's 99% women, and for ICLA, because 60% of the population of ICLA are women. Then in terms of the religious and the lay um, proportion, so the religious would also include the clergy, we still have 69% of the religious and the clergy, but we have a big number now of lay, 31% lay, persons, men and women, studying theology in these four schools. In terms of nationality, when I started teaching in 1996, in the classroom, I had Filipino students. But now, for the past 10 years, there, were, uh, there are now other nationalities in the classroom. So thus, there are 59% Filipinos, and other nationalities, we have 41%. And for the other nationalities, Many of them, or most of them, come from Asia. Of course, Philippines is in Asia, and the number one of the Asians who come to our schools are the Vietnamese. 
and of course we have some Chinese, Indians, Myanmar, Indonesia, Korea. And we also have a sprinkling of students from Latin America, from Europe, from USA, because they come from very different religious congregations. In terms of our faculty, in terms of gender, the farthest a column there, we have still men, 71%, and we have women, 29% in terms of faculty. The nationality of the faculty, we still have 66% Filipinos, but we have also 34% coming from other nationalities. In terms of educational attainment of our faculty, we have 64% doctorate level, with 84 of them men and 31 women, and we have 36% master's or licensed level. And in terms of the location of training, where our faculty did their theological studies and training, we have 34% trained in the Philippines, and we have 66% trained in different schools in Europe, in the US, and other places. So, in terms of the curriculum, I would say that these four schools give primary importance to the sacred scriptures as the soul of theology. Thus, if you look at the curriculum, you will see that it has a very systematic presentation of the Old and the New Testament courses, and which is the mark of Catholic theology as the International Theological Commission emphasizes Theology in all its diverse traditions, disciplines, and methods is founded on the fundamental act of listening in faith the revealed word of God, Christ himself. And, of course, the following fields of theology are taken up by the students, systematic, historical, moral, sacramental, and sacred liturgy, spiritual, pastoral, and missiology. LSD, moreover, offers spirituality and leadership and migration theology. And SVST has academic programs on liturgical studies and Vincentian studies, and ICLA has a special offering on consecrated life. Now, IFRS, as I mentioned, has a special MA program on women and religion, which the other schools do not have. But, of course, this is the school for the women. And as such, there are 12 feminist courses that have been offered in the Institute, so we have women and gender studies, methods of feminist research, methods of research and biblical hermeneutics, and the rest. And so all the students of the institute acquire knowledge on feminist critique and reconstruction of gender paradigms. And probably this is one reason why when I made a research in 2011, I discovered that many of our students from IFRS have really come up with research um, and A, this is research related to feminist hermeneutics or feminist theology. Now, in terms of the other three schools, when I made my study in 2011, I noticed that there was very little of feminist theology on those three schools. However, when I studied again the curriculum for this time, I found that it has not changed. In other words, there has been no improvement in the feminist theology perspective on those other three schools. So, the vision results. The vision mission of the schools are moving toward a balance between academic curriculum and contextual and intercultural aspects of reality. Second, the population which originally in the past was solidly male is becoming inclusive, encompassing those who study theology for priestly formation religious men and women who seek to have a good theological <coughs> tradition or foundation for the church ministry, and lay people, both men and women. And third, the clientele of the four schools of theology is no longer only Filipino, but has become international, with many Asians coming to study theology in the Philippines as well as other parts of the world. Fourth, the women students, though relatively fewer than the men, are studying theology, either in the master's or doctorate levels, if not taking the bachelor's or certificate non-degree programs. Fifth, the majority of the faculty members of the four schools are male, 71%, and the women, 29%. Although at I4S, women faculty are almost one half of the faculty population. As to nationality, 66% are Filipinos, 34% are non-Filipino. 
Six, the faculty staff in the four schools are highly qualified and experts in the field of theology and scriptures with the required degrees. 63% have doctoral degrees, while 36% have masters in licensure degrees, and 1% has a bachelor degree. 66% of the majority of the faculty earn their degrees in schools of theology in different parts of the world. Seven, although we have counted 53 women professors because I had to count every school how many women professors they had, but actually I discovered that there are only 33 women theologians in the four schools because some women theologians teach in two or three other schools of theology. So these women professors, 17 or 52% have doctorates and 16 or 48% have masters or licensure degrees. There are also 12 women with graduate degrees, masters and doctorate degrees, but they teach in fields related to theological education. For example, clinical psychology, they have um, archaeology, anthropology. So those are some courses that are related courses. The 19 or 56% of the women theologians earn their graduate degrees from well-known schools of theology in Europe and USA, while 14, 14 or 44% finish their degrees in the Philippines. Actually, there are still many other women theologians, but they, they're not teaching in the four schools that I have presented. Eight, the curriculum in the four schools is founded on sacred scriptures. And so I have mentioned this already, that IFRS has a special offer of women and religion as a specialization. And ninth, last, the four schools of theology are recognized as contributing to the advancement of doing theology in Asia and are becoming more inclusive of local and international students who are not only men being prepared for priestly formation, but also religious women and lay persons who are intent in taking up theology as a ministry, as a way of life, and as a career or profession. So I have some samples of Filipino women theologians I didn't get all of them, I didn't have the time to get all the pictures, but I, I present here my favorites. So one of them, one of them is here. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> so these are some, you, you can read some of the works, you'll find them uh, available in the internet or even in some books. Yeah, so I think you know very much Sister Dr. Mary John Manansan. She is a feminist theologian. Also, Sister Virginia Fabilia is a feminist theologian. Judith Galliares is so, and Sister Miriam Alejandrino, she is an ex chief So I just have those pictures, but I mentioned to you we have 33 of them, so um, I'm sure you'll find them in some literature that uh, you have in your studies. So there is a good mix of religious and lay women theologians in these four schools, 16 religious and 17 lay. Likewise, in their specializations, there is also a good mix of scriptures and other fields of theology. So you have, for example, systematics, spirituality, moral theology, so there's a good mix there. And from our own experience, the religious women are mostly part-time in their involvement in theological education. Why? So the congregation sent us to study formally theology until the doctorate level, when we come home, we are given administrative work in the congregations. And so, we cannot practice full-time theological education. And so that's why our lay women are more the full-time ones. So we have two of them here, and they are the ones who are involved in theological ministry and profession. But of course, some of them are involved in seminaries, schools of theology, but some of them are involved in teaching theology in the university and the colleges. So, our women theologians come from different theological places, thus contributing to richness and diversity of theological education. Moreover, a good number of them write books, articles in journals and magazines, as well as deliver conferences in and out of the country. So what is the impact of women theologians to women and men studying theology? So this is first. I say the feminist theologizing at IFRS has stimulated some students, both women and men, to write their MA theses on women issues. 
Second, research works of women theologians, our own research works, have influenced our teaching, and thus the thinking and insights of our students, as well as their listeners, or our listeners in conferences and theological circles, and the readers of our work. And I made an action research from my class. So I asked them, what do you think of your women professors? And this is what they had to say. They thought of this very well, you know? So I'll give you first what they say. The women professors, they say, are confident, well-prepared, skillful in delivery of lessons. They are as good as any male professor. Devoted, alive, interesting, creative, and have challenging insights. They are masters in their fields. They are motherly, more compassionate, show care, and teach from the heart. They are well-read and interested in what they do. Unlike, I did not say this, the students said this, unlike male professors who seem to teach out to obedience to their superiors. <laughs> and this is now the impact. They said this, this, these are the impact on them. That the women theologians demonstrate that study is not only about critical thinking, but involves the whole being. And they are able to smile during class, but male professors do not. <laughs> That's why I was so uh, impressed by Barbara because she was smiling all the time. I said, "That is the woman." She smiled too. Then they approach a concept in a less rigid manner and come up with a wider perspective of things considered. Pay attention to details. They expose students to the feminist perspective of interpreting the Bible. They guide students to deepen their faith and see God in a mature and scholarly way. They make us realize that the church is composed of male and female with a view on inclusivity. They inspire us to be gentle and caring for others. Their wholehearted way of offering the best in teaching invites students to become authentic witness of Christ. Through the lessons in scriptures, students experience conversion. They formed our theological foundations, always encouraging and teaching the skills needed for independent learning. So these are all what my students say, said about their women um, professors. So I asked them, how many women professors have you had so far? Some said two, some said four. And actually, when I visited our dean at LSD, to report for the, for the term, for the second semester, he gave me a good news. He said, do you know that 50% of our graduate students, masters and doctoral students, are specializing on the scriptures? Of course, I'm happy because I teach scriptures, and that means I have influence on our students to take um, the specialization on scriptures. So, what is the future of women theologians in the Philippines? And now, of course, it goes to Asia because our students now are also Asian. So, from the statistics that I made, there are 222 young religious women and 289 lay women and men, or 56% of the population of the four schools of theology coming either from the Philippines and other Asian countries. And they're taking bachelor's graduate courses in theology and scriptures. So if these students, women and men, especially religious and lay, endure the rigors of theological education, because as we know, for all of us who have gone through the, the, the discipline of theological education, it is not an easy field of study. So those who endure, they will become our potential religious women and lay women and men teachers of theology and scriptures say in the next 10 years in the Philippines and in Asia. So when I retire, because in 10 years I will retire, so I will have students to take my place. Or my own students will be the teachers of theology and scriptures. And now I quote Agnes in her article. She says that the more theological approach of Pope Francis is an opportunity for Asian women theologians to push for a greater recognition of their role in the church. Of course, there are also some problems that our 
uh, Asian women uh, students and theologians meet because when they go back to their countries, they are not easily accepted, especially when they have become more liberal in their thinking. Then, also, the new directives of our Pope on the important role of consecrated persons and lay persons in the theological formation of seminarians and priests is a recognition of the place and role of women and lay persons in theological education in the church. So let me just quote some of these, and let quote all. So I have this from the gift of the priestly vocation, the instruction, a number 150, 151, or 143, 144. So in number 150, it says here, I quote, the presence of the laity and of the consecrated persons in the seminary is an important point of reference in the formative journey of the candidates. And number 151, <coughs> the presence of women in the seminary journey of formation has its own formative significance. They can be found as specialists on the teaching staff, within the apostolate, within families, and in the service to the community. In 143, the contribution of members of institutes of consecrated life and societies of apostolic life and also of the lay faithful can be of value in certain circumstances. So it really opens up for us, for the religious and the lay, the possibility for um, participating in the theological formation of our seminarians and our future priests. There seems to be then a bright future for women religious and lay women and men to become future professors of scriptures and theology in seminaries and schools of theology. But we also take a look at the Apostolic Constitution on Ecclesiastical Faculties, Veritatis Gaudium 2017, which does not make a gender distinction of teachers to be hired in an ecclesiastical faculty, but gives importance to thorough educational preparation. So which means that the religious women and lay should go through the theological formation and preparation, and even as far as a doctorate degree, to be able to teach in the ecclesiastical faculty. Um, there is also a provision here for permanent and non-permanent teachers. So the permanent teachers are the full-time teachers, and the non-permanent teachers are the um, part, not full-time teachers. And so the non-permanent teachers will never have a chance to have a Neil Obstad for teachers of ecclesiastical faculty because they are not permanent teachers. And so I have a problem here because I am a part-time teacher, so an associate professor part-time, and so which means that even if I do my best to teach, I will never get a Neil Obstad for teachers of ecclesiastical faculty, even if I'm teaching in an ecclesiastical faculty. But of course, that is not important for me, but I'm just wondering, so I have a question mark here, why is this so? Because in the past, they did not ask our backgrounds. Actually, it was only last year when I was asked to make a thorough curriculum vitae to be submitted to Rome. And I said, why? I'm doing it for the first time. And then I realized maybe they're trying to see what I'm writing and, you know, also to control the things that the teachers are um, delivering in class. So those are probably, that's a question that I'd like to raise. Next, the religious congregations in the Philippines should modify their perspective of mission. Because, you know, as I said, in the religious congregations, many only have one year theological formation. And why? Because they are sent to the mission, but after that, the sisters are given the opportunity to finish their master's doctorate in education because we have many schools, or to study nursing because we have many hospitals to take care of. But theology is only a sideline. But then I'm, I'm trying to suggest that if the religious congregations will include the teaching of theology and scriptures as a full-time permanent mission, it's not only a sideline. With me, it's a sideline now. But what if I can be a full-time faculty? I remember Sister Helen Graham. She is my co-faculty. And when I, was, um, when I first came in after my studies, 
and I was given um, a task as a school administrator. So I had to be a school administrator and I had to teach theology. So I was limited from teaching four or five subjects, I was limited to teaching one to two subjects. And then she said to me, we said, that is mortal sin what you are doing. <laughs> mortal sin. Why? Because you have gone through these studies and there are not so many women who have done your study and now they put you in administration. So what happens now to theological education? That is mortal sin. So I would like to suggest to the religious congregations that we really take it seriously and put this as part of our ministry, the teaching of theology and scriptures. So feminist theology will become a major field in theology if it will be consciously integrated in the academic curriculum of the three schools. So I had a chance to talk with the deans and also to check whether my perception is correct. And I asked the deans, uh, is it true that, that you are not offering any uh, feminist course in, in the bachelor's or in the master's level? And they accepted it. But um, two schools are offering feminist theories um, in, in the doctorate level. And so they told me, but we are, offering, we are offering feminist theology because some of our teachers are integrating feminist theology in their teaching. But that depends on who the teachers are. But it's not in the curriculum. And then one said, but in our life, in the way we live together, because in ICLA, for example, they have a community life, so, so there we express uh, the inclusivity of our community. But it is not offered in the curriculum. So one dean said, actually, we would like to put it in the curriculum, but we have a problem. We don't have the teachers. So who will teach? So that's a challenge to the women theologians that this initiative should come from us that we will, now when we come up with curriculum improvements or revisions, we should be able to put in our hand and suggest to them that there should be courses on feminist theories or feminist theology and the like, so that this will become really a major field in our study. So conclusion, the Philippines can offer a solid theological training for women and men from Asian <coughs> countries and other nationalities. <coughs> There is hope for women in theology in the near future in Asia. So religious women are challenged to pursue graduate degrees in theology and be engaged as scholars and professionals in the field of theology, scriptures, and others. Increasing number of lay women and men are studying theology so that lay theologians will have a role in theological education in the Philippines in the near future. And feminist theology needs to be consciously integrated in the academic curriculum and theological education is for all Christians. Thus, is inclusive of the ordained ministry, consecrated women and men, lay women and men. Thank you. Our second speaker today uh, is Mari Carmen Lacamontes. Um, she's a Benedictine nun and the superior, uh, superior at Bread of Life Monastery in Torreon, Mexico as well as a founding member and instructor of Sense Scholastica Center for the Development of Women there. She holds a licentiate in theology from the Jesuit Seminary at uh, Ibero-American University in Mexico City. Uh, she also participated in the doctoral program of ministry at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. And her areas of interest are biblical spirituality, the theology of consecrated life, human development, and affectivity and sexuality in the celibate person. I'm going to share with us this, uh, some uh, words about this uh, situation. How is the Catholic women's access to education and theological teaching in Latin America and the Caribbean has space in process and uphill road. I am very uh, grateful for the opportunity that you have given me to be here because it allows me to take a closer look, look at some conditions we are in with regard to theological education and teaching in my part of the world. Uh, what I am going to say uh, something about is uh, in this 
Vatican uh, to open up new but limited theological horizons for women in Latin America and the Caribbean. Some words about liberation and feminist theologies. The ongoing struggle of feminist theologians in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, women's ways of teaching theology are faced with many obstacles. Some words about this. And uh, then some uh, uh, challenges for the future. And uh, some conclusions. So, uh, related to this Vatican II Open Up New but Limited Theological Horizons for Women in Latin America and the Caribbean. Since the Second Vatican Council, theological studies and academic degrees in the field were gradually opened up to include women and lay people in general. It has been a slow process. At first, women were admitted to some subjects to help them in their pastoral work. Courses were offered to catechists to give them basic training in their field. When women were admitted to full degree programs in theology, the courses were limited to programs approved by the magisterium. They were trained to learn and think and teach the accepted traditional official church doctrine. The theological discourse available to them responded to a cultural context based on gender, racial, and class hierarchies. Today, context, uh, cultural context is in the process of transformation with the emergence, recognition, and gradual acceptance of diversity and pluralism, among other elements. Yet, even today in Latin America and the Caribbean, the majority of theology teachers and investigators are men. A word about liberation and feminist theologies. Liberation theology flourished in Latin America and the Caribbean in the 1960s and 70s. The preferential option for the poor was at its very heart. At that time, women found themselves at the crossroads in need of doing their own reflection. In theory, liberation theology allows for the emergence of a diversity of theological subjects and differing conditions for those subjects. The liberation theologians introduce certain elements of sociological and historical analysis marked by the preferential option for the poor. But they continue to use the same traditional theology. The poor they refer to had no particular face or gender. They were the poor in general, poor in the sense of material poverty. From their masculine perspective of God, the poor and the kingdom, many liberation theologians, theologians look to socialism and a social revolution as the keys to transformation that would include all of mankind. During, during the golden years of liberation theology, many women received the formation in based Christian communities, not just in the classroom. Some women theologians embraced liberation theology and took it beyond its male horizons. They began to approach women's social movement, movements and feminist theology from their own experience and scientific reflection. From there, they went on to search for new resources. They wanted to do theology in dialogue with the causes of oppression, exclusion, <coughs> and discrimination of women in general, and poor women in particular. 
many liberation theologians, both men and women, objected. They considered that feminist theology was a betrayal, another infiltration of the North American empire, and an imitation of the first world that served to divide the struggle of the poor. For the poor. They accepted a feminine theology or a theology of woman, but not feminism. In spite of the opposition, Latin American feminists found the key that opened up the possibility of doing theology within the context of liberation theology. Women suffer a double oppression, or triple, or more. They are not only materially poor, but are also discriminated against because of their gender. Some words about the ongoing struggle of feminist theologians in Latin America and the Caribbean. Today, there are more women theologians than in the past, and some of them are influential in their field. There are groups of women theologians making headway uh, in Argentina, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Brazil, in the Dominican Republic, and other countries. Dr. Socorro Vivas, a theology professor at the Pontif Pontifical University in Bogota, Colombia, informed me that after years of a struggle, at present, 10% of the theology faculty are women. A large group of women theologians in Colombia state that without exception, they have experienced some type of violence in their professional lives at times from all sides. They have joined together and resisted the violence with resilience and gradually become empowered. One of their main goals is to form a new generation of feminist theologians. There are still far too few women theologians and with too little influence at the decision-making level. The struggle has continued. Feminist theologians are still working to achieve greater recognition, to claim the right to be present and visible in spaces too long reserved exclusively for men, to gain acceptance for a different way of doing theology, a part in which health, heart, and soul unite in a fruitful and graceful dance that will lead to a fresh reflection on faith. Women students of theology in many of our countries have been witnesses to and or survivors of uh, misogyny, both on the part of their classmates and their teachers. Their introduction of feminist theological reflection in the classroom has often been ridiculed or belittled. Their input undervalued. Their grievances ignored. Women students have frequently suffered a pale form of violence for having invaded men's sacred space. Although this situation has improved in many places today, and in general there is a greater respect for women, there is often still a hidden suspicion of women's contribution to theology when it is in any way connected to feminism. From my own experience, I can say that it was not easy for me to study theology. 
but it has been one of the most challenging and marvelous experiences of my life. I had to knock on the door many times before I was accepted, accepted as a full-time student. That was from 1988 to 1992. The reason I was given more than once for not being accepted was that women who started the program abandoned their studies along the way and they would occupy a place that a male student could have taken advantage of. I was self-taught on theological questions from the perspective of women. 30 years ago, there was a good collection of articles on these topics in the theological magazines available at my school library. I was continually sharing my insights from this alternative perspective with my, my classmates. I graduated the only woman in my class, the only person not going on the ordinate, ordained ministry, and with the second highest grade point average in the group. The day of my graduation, one of my classmates said, Mari Carmen finished her studies with that average because she has a man's head on her shoulders. <laughs> I soon discovered that the scholarship offered for postgraduate studies were only available to men. There was nothing offered for women at that time at the school I studied theology. So, some words about women's ways of teaching theology are faced with many obstacles. Unless they repeat the male model, women are often frowned upon in their teaching style and content. For example, some academics tend to look down on their way of teaching as experiential and catechetical rather than a truly academic. This type of judgment reflects a lack of understanding or, and or acceptance of alternative forms of theological reflection. What some dismiss as experiential is in fact a response to the particular context that has been culturally as assigned to women. Each subject has her his own integrity, and it is valid to take the whole person into account as a human being in our theological reflection. Women with advanced degrees in theology often find it hard to acquire or maintain a teaching position. They can usually do it if they conform to established codes of thought and action, but if they question any of the principles that pretend to justify discrimination and exclusion, it becomes almost impossible for them to find or keep a faculty position. For many, to stray from the traditional theology that has been produced or reproduced by male theologians is considered a betrayal of the deposit of the faith. As has been said, a woman can teach theology, but it must be traditional theology. Very few exceptions have been documented in the schools of theology of our continent. Sister uh, Mary Lou Roja Salazar from Mexico describes her situation in this way. I am the first woman in Mexico to earn a doctoral degree in systemic theology. I passed my doctoral exam with the highest honor from the Catholic University of Louvain. I don't have a full-time job at any Catholic university. I am underpaid. I have no French benefits 
and then look forward to a retirement pension. I always seem to have to demonstrate my knowledge and wisdom with twice as much effort as my male colleagues. I see some of my students who haven't even finished a master's degree being chosen for post as investigators or directors of theological institutes. And some of them are very comfortable playing the patriarchal game. End of quote. The academic world, supposedly open to innovation, continues to be suspicious of the advances offered by women, especially in the areas of philosophy and theology. There is very little space for alternative, pluralistic ways of thinking, even where academic freedom is apparently valued. When the contribu contribution of feminist theology are mentioned, they are usually considered as an ideology, contrary to Catholic teaching with regard to the family and the role of women in the family. Challenges for the future. A word and an invitation to review the Aparecida document. Because in the Aparecida document, uh, the document reinforces cultural discrimination of women. For me, one of the greatest challenges is the urgent need to review and correct the theological anthropology at the root of this problem. This anthropology is present in the Aparecida document published by the Latin American bishops at the close of their general conference in Aparecida, Brazil in 2007. The document offers pastoral guidelines for the church in Latin America for the next generation. Unfortunately, it defines the identity and mission of both women and men in such a way that they leg legitimate non-inclusive cultural stereotypes of women. Non-inclusive, the cultural ways, in a cultural way. It is inter interesting to note that then Cardinal George Jorge Bergoglio took part in the conference and headed a committee uh, that drafted the concluding document. Pope Francis quotes it frequently. There are many valuable, valuable, valuable elements in the document, including its vision of discipleship, mission, and care for the environment. However, its treatment of women's identity and mission marks a step backward from the previous Santo Domingo document. In spite of the beautiful introductory paragraphs dedicated to women, uh, numbers 451 to 455, the Aparacida document does not live up to expectation. It fails to offer elements for the transformation of the situation of inequality and discrimination that women experience in the Catholic Church and in society in Latin America and the Caribbean. Although throughout the document there are some references to war, women and men that do not repeat the usual stereotypes in the defining paragraphs, we find a traditional dualistic complementary mentality. Once again, women, once again, women are identified with nature and men with culture. There are strong affirmations about the equal and absolute dignity of both women and men, number one or four, and the right and responsibility of women to participate in the building up of society and the church, 452, 456, 457. <laughs> Yet, there are significant distinctions made when the document speaks of concrete forms, forms of participation. For example, uh, number 459, I quote, 
in terms of what is specific, specific to them, males are called by the God of life to occupy an original and necessary place in building society, generating culture, and forming history. Deeply motivated by the beautiful reality of love, whose source is Jesus Christ, men feel, feel strongly invited, invited to form a family. There, in an essential disposition of reciprocity and complementarity for the fullness of their own life, they experience and appreciate the active and irreplaceable richness of women's contribution, which enables them to recognize more clearly their own identity." End of quote. The emphasis on men's original and necessary place in building society and culture and working history comes before the formation of a family. Number 460 also refers explicitly to men as disciples and missionaries of Jesus Christ. The document clearly shifts its focus when referring to women whose identity and essential ministry are to receive, welcome, nourish, give birth, sustain, and accompany life. That's wonderful, but it's for what? Women are called to use their being as women to create habitable spaces of community and communion. Number four, uh, five, seven, and four, five, eight. Aparecida speaks of the professional development of women and their participation in society, 452, 456, 457, as a legitimate but definitely secondary. Women are not mentioned explicitly as disciples and missionaries. It would seem that their participation takes place because men, unfortunately, renounce their mission and delegate it to women. Number 460. This essentialist view of gender is at the heart of the matter. Historically, it has often been used to justify social, legal, political, and ecclesial inequities. And it seems that they are not aware of that. Another section of the document, the bishops leads a series of challenges to evangelization. Paragraph 40 reflects a fear that the ideology of gender is undermining the family. With few exceptions, the Latin American and Caribbean hierarchy has condemned the ideology of gender as a radical notion according to which each and every one can choose his or her sexual orientation. With this very limited point of view, they have gone on to suspect, reject, or ignore not only feminism as a whole, but also the valuable contribution that the gender perspective brings to economics, sociology, and education, and the valuable, valuable input of feminist theology to scriptures, studies, ethics, ritual, anthropology, spirituality, to name only some areas. These attitudes have colored the hierarchy attitudes toward feminist theologians. They have also reduced the possibilities of fruitful dialogue and collaboration with groups that use a gender perspective for social development and offer valuable insights for pastoral responses to human needs. The vicious would do well to follow their own pastoral commitment made in the previous conference celebrated in the Dominican Republic in 1992. Conference uh, uh, to discern, I quote number 108, to discern in light of the gospel of Jesus 
those movements that are struggle in favor of women from different perspectives to discern, similar in invitation, to discern in light of the gospel of Jesus, those movements that are struggle in favor of women from different perspectives in order to encourage the values that they have, enlighten what seems confusing, and announce whatever is contrary to human dignity. And of course, much of their focus on the subject has been dedicated to denouncing and condemn. Much of the uh, other challenges that we face are the following. To continue to publish articles and books, to participate in and to organize events with a gender perspective. In this way, we can respond to today's challenges based on critical reflection in our efforts to further empower women and promote equal opportunities and mutual respect. Three or another, to encourage young women today, both religious sisters and lay women, to study theology and go on for advanced degrees. This is not always easy in a church that tends not to value women theologians in a society that is open in many other areas of development to women. To establish and strengthen networks of women theologians for mutual encouragement and support in the ongoing development of feminist theologies. To share and make translations available of articles and books of feminist theologies. There is an urgent need for more well-prepared women at the decision-making level in the church in general and the academic world in particular. This implies the presence of more competent women in leadership roles. I want to add that the fierce women theologians in Mexico, uh, they needed to go out to the country because they don't find where to practice. Uh, one from uh, another Christian uh, faith, that is Elsa Tamis, and Maria Pilar Aquino. Uh, other, other problem is that uh, in most places in Latin America, the theological education of women, strictly speaking, is not considered at real or authentic theology. For them, ciencias religiosas, that is uh, less level. Theology, real theology, authentic theology, is reserved for the preparation of future ordained ministers. <coughs> In conclusion, I agree with Maria Claire Winkemer that to study, to get degrees, to have theological discussion on an equal footing with men, to stay at the table as hard as that may be, might be, will help us and the next generation to move forward on this rocky, happier road to full access and participation in a church and theology that truly values diversity. Thank you. Our third paper is written by Charity Musamba. Uh, fortunately, we have her paper, which I'm going to read, but she is not here today because she uh, had some difficulties with getting visa. Uh, Cherry Dimsamba holds a PhD in political science uh, from University of Rosenberg Essen in Germany and she currently teaches on international political economy in the University of Zambia's Department of Development Studies program. Her recent publications include uh, the title of the book State of Democracy in Zambia and uh, the second book title is The Developmental State in Africa, Prospects, Possibilities and Challenges. Uh, I have a privilege of reading her paper. What I want to say is if you love the paper, then I'll take credit for delivery. But if you don't, if you disagree with the paper, then I'll say I'm just a messenger. <laughs> um, and thank you, Karen, for helping with that PowerPoint. Um, Dr. Busama's paper is entitled Women and Leadership in the Catholic Church. 
the lay Catholic women's groups and strategic leadership in uh, rural Zambia. It is a narration of the roles that women-focused lay groups are playing in providing strategic leadership in the Catholic Church. The examples are drawn from various rural areas of Zambia. The paper provides a general description of the contributions that such lay groups are making to the sustenance and growth of both the church and the surrounding communities. The premise of the paper is that the emergence and sustenance of women lay groups has been one of the most significant achievements in the Catholic Church in Zambia. This is because these groupings are providing strategic leadership and enriching the spiritual and social identity of the church. And they do so in line with the call for the church to encourage and enable women to assume ecclesiastical and societal responsibilities. Discussions about the roles and contribution of women in the Catholic Church are now becoming common in Zambia. These include questions about the role of women in decision-making places, their particip participation in laity groups and in shaping decisions in the church. This is because the church has recognized its legitimate duty of recognizing and liberating women by providing them with opportunities to make their voice heard and to express their talents through both pastoral and ministry initiatives. As guided, guided by Pope Benedict XVI, to encourage and promote the formation of women so that they may assume their proper share of responsibility and participation in the community life of society and of the church." End quote. In particular, the social teaching of the Catholic Church assumes that human beings are social and that they depend on each other for existence spiritually, intellectually, and emotionally. A remarkable development in the Catholic Church in this regard has included the growth and sustenance of women-focused lay groupings. Examples in this case include the National Catholic Women's League, the St. Anna Organization, and the Legion of Mary. In Zambia, the Catholic Women's League was established in 1964 by Sister Xavier at Rugamba Kabata Parish in the Saka district. Uh, the organization of St. Anna was formed in 1975 and it began to gain a national representation by 1978. The beginning of the Legion of Mary, Zambia, can be traced as far back as 1966. Given that these lay groups have committed themselves to use their talents and skills in the service of the church and the community at all levels, their activities and structures transcend beyond the parishes, branches, and uh, zones, and down to the communities. These groupings are involved in a wide range of church and community building activities. The activities range from cleaning and maintaining the church premises, washing the cassocks or the clergy, to decorating the altar, conducting, a, uh, to conducting marriage counseling, to visiting the sick, both at home and hospitalized, managing funerals, and raising funds for various church activities. It, have, it has also been recognized that women leadership is essential in the deepening of the church's identity and legitimate mission as a family. In some areas, such as the eastern rural parts of Zambia, Catholic Women's League and St. Anna are representatives in both the parish council and parish executive committees. This gives them the opportunity to contribute and influence decision outcomes on important matters of the church. These organizations have been able to influence the attitudes and behavior of not only their members, but surrounding communities as well. This is because they do not only provide spiritual guidance to their members, but also provide a variety of local social services such as health, nutrition, care for the vulnerable and aged, public awareness, and sensitization on, sensitization on various social, cultural, and economic issues. These activities bring them in close contact with various groupings in society. For example, the Women Catholic League has mounted a nationwide uh, campaign particularly strong in the rural areas on anti-gender based violence. The association has organized workshops and seminars that have targeted its own members and the general members of the community. In some rural areas such as Katete district in the eastern province of Zambia, the Women Catholic League, the, the Women Catholic League has built an exterior altar and a kitchen for the parish. Groups such as St. Anna in areas such as Masa District in the northern Zambia have been in the forefront of providing support in the form of health, nutrition, and sanitation to the old and vulnerable. 
The, lead, uh, the leading role of women lay groups in the area of health is particularly relevant given that health services in the rural areas of Zambia are inadequate and most often of poor quality. These organizations reach out most vulnerable and sick, provide health education, counseling, and material support where necessary. For instance, they are the main backbone for the successes registered with regard to the provision of home-based care for persons living with HIV and AIDS, creation and managing of community support groups as well as providing the necessary information on HIV and AIDS. In both cases, these organizations have established links with the other stakeholders in their efforts to reach the wider community with messages on counseling and testing, which is cardinal in the fight against the pandemic. Specifically, their involvement in HIV pre prevention has also involved lobbying both local and national government authorities to prioritize the health needs of the rural population. Some of the areas where they have undertaken successful advocacy include the provision of testing services, care for the HIV positive, expectant mothers, and the provision of antiretroviral anti treatment of new, to newborns. For instance, in Kasama district in the northern part of Zambia, the Catholic Women, uh, Women's League, through its home-based care program, has been in the forefront of in supplementing government efforts addressing the health and material needs of the suffering people infected by HIV. The women lay groups also undertake charity works and raise funds required in sustaining some church activities. For instance, the leaders of the Catholic Women's Organization in Kansaba Parish have set up the Seminarian Fund to which all Catholic women are expected to make their contribution. Besides the Seminarian Fund, the women are also, were also given lessons on entrepreneurship and on how to start and manage businesses. In Lupe, mission of the Lopala province, the Legion of Mary has been leased some farmland to be, that belongs to the mission for income generation activities. This group has been cultivating groundnuts and cassava, and their resources gained are channeled to the church. In Mongu Diocese of the western part of Zambia, the Women's Catholic League have set up women groups in the villages and trained them in activities of poultry tailoring and small trading ventures as a means of promoting financial and economic empowerment. So several points to highlight. First, it is important to acknowledge the roles and contributions that lay women groupings are making in sustaining both the, group, the church and the communities in rural Zambia. Second, it is important to accept that women are influential, organized, and responsive to the call of the social teaching of the church. Third, Given the fact that women in the church constitute the largest number, number, it is important that their views are taken into consideration in the decision-making processes. In conclusion, this paper has demonstrated that given the space and opportunity, women are able, with minimal resources, to contribute significantly to both the pastoral and ministry missions of the Catholic Church in Zambia. In addition, these women work under difficult conditions given the low standards of living and development that characterize the rural areas of Zambia. On this basis, it would be important for the church hierarchy to continue providing the necessary support and incentives that such, such lay women grouping need in order, not, in order to sustain their activities. These activities symbolize, in practical terms, the strategic leadership roles that women in the Catholic Church have been demonstrating for a long time. Well, the way they should talk on, okay, enlighten us so much. Different things going on in that good church. A lot of good stuff you may have not heard. Um, recently, the Holy Father has assembled representative bodies of young people to express their views about good church. I have not heard that he's done the same thing with women. I know often women are talked into the idea of family, which he's given a lot of emphasis to. But do you know of any particular initiative by this good Pope to have women's issues distinctly presented to him and through him to the whole church?
My point is, where is the root of uh, the problem? Where is, uh, I think, if we attend uh, this uh, Yeah, that's the, 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 the root of the problem. We, we really can change things. But as I think that in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the scores uh, in the teachings of the church, uh, there are these uh, uh, this ambiguous, uh, this ambiguous position related to it, and, and we need to clarify where uh, the roots of the problems are, because at least in Latin America, uh, people. Uh, listen to the teaching, the teachings of the, of the church, and they really confuse themselves. There is not a clear position related to them. There is indeed initiative from our home to open the issue of women in the church. Um, in the meeting of the Union International Superior General in Rome, uh, this was an issue brought by the women superiors to the to the Pope, and the Pope indeed showed openness to discussion on possibilities even of women becoming deacons. But as far as where the discussion has gone, there is no resolution yet. And also, as I have mentioned in my presentation, he has come out with his instruction on the gift of the priestly vocation, and indeed very clearly he has uh, underlined the important role of the consecrated women and lay people in the formation of the uh, priests, uh, future priests, as well as in the um, apostolic constitution on the um, Veritatis Gaudium, that also underlined the importance of the consecrated women and lay women in the um, journey in the journey of formation of the uh, future priests. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Maria uh, Carmen, I'm really shocked at what you say about uh, the condition of uh, women theologians in Mexico. Uh, I remember Back in the 1980s, I was looking for scholarship to study scripture. And the very office that gives scholarship to priests offered me to do either catechesis or religious studies to get the scholarship. And when my mother general had it, she said she would use all the money she had to train me. So I think uh, the religious congregations could help to change the face of what is happening in, in the country by sending religious people to study theology. I think the more religious women who are trained in different uh, areas of theology in the country could help to open those shut doors uh, that are doors that are shut to women. I think this could really help when religious congregations send their sisters or even lay women to study. I know my congregation has trained some lay women in theology, those who are interested. This could change the face of this. Thank you. Right now, the, the deans of schools of theology are looking for women professors. It's because of the instructions of the Pope. At the same time, 
I think, like for example, in, in the Loyola School of Theology, I was asked the possibility of one of my sisters who just finished her studies to be a full-time professor there. Uh, why? Because it has been shown from experience that the women were good teachers. And so they would like the women to be added to the roster of their faculty. Besides, the women are the less, the minority. <coughs> so they would like to add more women. And so if <coughs> anybody of you would like to teach in our schools of theology, I think I can recommend you. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, two comments or questions that are not very well formulated in my own mind at the moment. Uh, first to, to uh, Sister Nisheta, um, it is sometimes my experience that the religious orders work in one world and the diocesan church, local church, in another sphere. So the religious women are treated in one way and lay women in quite a different way. Uh, what is available to a lay woman is definitely different from what is available to a religious woman. So is there a place where the two worlds can meet so that the religious women can assist a little bit in the uh, education or the opening up of things for lay women. And also, I find that the religious orders are not very often tolerant of the local church because of all the difficulties that they encounter. But the lay women, they have to put up with everything. <laughs> Either from the religious or from the church. So, do you have this uh, happening and do you see a place for some kind of meeting uh, of minds? That's one question, sorry, I have one more. <laughs> Regarding the cultural anthropology that you mentioned, that is there a way, uh, is it enough that women are present in forums so that we can start to change the way we express our cultural anthropology of how things work? Or what should we do? to bring about some kind of uh, shift in the mentality. So, so I think that's a good question. So what is the relationship between the diocese and the religious congregation? Um, the religious congregation works in the diocese. And so we have to see to it that the vision and mission of the diocese is being carried out by the religious congregation. However, the religious congregation is independent from the management of the diocese. As long as we participate in the programs of the diocese, so like if we have schools in the diocese, we are able to give contributions for the programs of the diocese, then we are able to do our work uh, peacefully and we are able to chart the, the mission that we have. So in that sense, we are independent from the diocese. However, if the diocese sees that we are doing something that is against their um, vision or mission, then they can always call our attention. Like one example is nowadays, some of our dioceses, our bishops are looking into the schools, the Catholic schools, because you know, the sisters, when they run schools, they are, they are um, very economical, so that the schools grow. And so now they look this, at the schools, and the schools are big, and they say the sisters have a lot of money. And so now, some, especially the, the, the economy of the congregation will come and try to see what the sisters can do to help the diocese financially. So then, um, we have to draw the line, but if there is a good relationship between the sisters and the diocese, the congregation and the diocese, then things will go right. But in the Philippines now, um, many of our schools had this use of the use of the property. 
for 99 years. But there is now a change that now the use of rope means 50 years. So which means if you're standing on church lands, we will have to be very careful whether are we going to develop this, this property or not, because after 50 years, the church might take them. We also have experience of congregations giving up their schools because the bishop writes a letter that we are going to take over your school. So uh, for many of us, our attitude is, if they would want to take the school, so we go and give the school to them. But our experience is when they take over the schools, they're not able to do so as we did or as we do. Because why? Because of our common life, we are able to put all our resources together and we are able to save and then we're able to build buildings. So um, the lay people in that light will be in a more difficult situation. So we will have to really have good relationship with the diocese. Now, in regard to the lay people working in the diocese, there are many programs now where lay are needed. And so they get the lay people for the VECs, for the maintenance in the office, the secretaries, the secretary of the different, um, uh, let's say, programs that they have. But at the same time, the problem is that they do not pay enough. Actually, as a professor of theology, part of my, um, what do you call that, honorarium is contributed service. So even if I have a doctorate degree, I get this much because it is understood that I am a missionary, so part of my service is contributed service. And that becomes also more difficult when it is a lay person who has a family. So if she teaches in a school of theology, and it will be considered as contributed service, she will not be given the proper um, honorarium that accrue to the, to the uh, what do you call this, the, the, the qualification of the faculty. So therefore, how will the lay person uh, sustain and maintain her family or his family? So those are some uh, problems that we have to face, we face. And sometimes because of that, some lay people, they men and women, they leave the schools of theology and they go to the universities because the universities pay well. So that becomes now a, uh, a problem for maintaining the faculties in the schools of theology. Um, for us, in terms of the religious and relationship with the lady, it has become already uh, part of our system that the lay are our partners in ministry. Especially that we have now a dwindling number of vocations. So uh, what we have done in our congregation is we have put up a lay association so that when we have no more sisters, the lay association will continue our ministries. And so we're able to relate with the lay on equal footing so that the lay can be executive vice presidents, they can be uh, heads of offices because we know that we are not able to sustain it because we are very few at the moment. And so, um, well, in, in the Philippines, it's really very difficult to be a lay person and to be a faculty in a school of theology. For, for the purpose of how to maintain your living. But if you are single, and if you really have passion to teach theology, you won't mind it. But if you have children and family to sustain, it will be a very difficult decision to continue. But at least we have universities that teach theology, so they can teach in the universities. related to your question, and thank you for that. I think that we really need a conversion, a real conversion. And we need to uh, mature in faith. We need adults in faith. Uh, at least in my context, 
we don't have this uh, environment to uh, help each other to uh, mature in faith. Many, many things in the, in the church uh, are or working to maintain the persons as uh, immature, not really immature. So uh, we need this process. We need adult people. We need to change metrics. And we need to go to the woods. And uh, we cannot change with the same ways we have used until today. We really are in a change of epoch if we need to transform, transform everything. And, uh, and it's, it, it's not a, uh, we don't know how it's going to be, but absolutely the way we are living in, in our Catholic Church in Latin America is not working anymore. We need to change. Absolutely. And we need conversion. And only uh, mature pe pe persons that, uh, that the psychological sciences uh, teach us that we only are able to conversion if we have this self, uh, the real self, uh, we integrate our person. Is is the only possibility to a real conversion. So we need to mature. And uh, we need to look for it. So Mary Carmen, I was really uh, shocked by the, the quotes that you're doing from the Apatisiva document. I didn't guess I didn't realize that it was in there, but the kind of caricature of gender um, gender ideology that's in there and so on. And I guess Jorge uh, Bergoglio had a, a key role in writing those documents, and, and he seems to have a sort of blind spot around this thing. He doesn't seem, I mean, I love Pope Francis, um, but when it comes to this question of gender, I mean, he doesn't seem to see a whole lot of room between, on the one hand, essentialist ideas of gender where it's biologically determined and set in stone, and on the other hand, this kind of world in which everybody wakes up in the morning and says, well, what gender do I want to be today? You know, um, he, he, there's this, this, this sort of dystopian kind of, you know, nightmarish, uh, everything up for grabs kind of view on the other hand and so and I'm wondering where that comes from in Pope Francis's thought and it, it occurs to me like a couple of possibilities one is that he thinks uh, that uh, talk of gender is an elite thing it's a northern you know kind of western thing that's being imposed on the rest of the world and he also seems to link it to capitalism, right? Capitalism is creative destruction. It shakes everything up, and gender is yet one more thing that it kind of shakes up. And so he thinks um, that this is, a, again, a kind of elite uh, discourse that preys on the poor. So if Pope Francis were here, um, what, and this is a question, I guess, for both of you, what, what would you say to him to, try to alleviate some of those fears and create a space in between those kind of two poles on, on uh, the discourse of, of gender. It would be great if you were here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can First talk with him. Maybe <laughs> invite him to enter in this perspective, uh, to know uh, all the resources that have been made, that are uh, at hand. Because when he, he said, oh, I'm going to uh, uh, name a commission to, uh, to look or to, uh, yeah, for uh, the, 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 the 
face of women and children, there are a lot of resources. There are a lot of people that have been reflecting on this new way to uh, the, the hermeneutics interpretation of Bible that give us a huge and broad perspective on how does it mean to be human, to be sister and brothers, to be a humanity. Uh, and uh, what I would like to, to, to tell him is, uh, could we read and talk and see how in history has been uh, developed in, in, in this way of see uh, humanity because he's very good in cosmic situations. This, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Laudato Si is great. He can make the connections and, oh my, that's, that's great. And I know they, 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 uh, they have a, a lot of, of uh, consultants that, that uh, give them many resources. But they don't have women as a resource. They don't have uh, uh, women scriptures, women uh, 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 yeah, uh, that have these, these sources. And I think you said one uh, huge obst obstacle is this idea. Uh, is confused, uh, and I think one person said here in this forum, I think uh, yesterday, uh, all all this uh, aspect of of, uh, of human uh, reality of body, sexuality, uh, all all the the body, uh, all that we have, and, and and that theology has been now able to. Uh, to put together in, it's like if we were, uh, we are, with this uh, Cartesian mentality, with this Aristotelical Thomistic mentality, uh, that we describe reality with these concepts that are antagonic, that are hierarchical, that I, uh, that are, uh, yeah, uh, ex uh, excluyentes. So we can, uh, we can make the connections. So I think this change of epoch is a big challenge to look for the connection, the real connection in, in trying to really look for how to uh, walk little by little to, to make this reality that is uh, this goal of God to be one, to be one and uh, transform this mentality that divides everything and put in antagonic situation. Uh, all of us need to work on it. No, not only the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> so if the Pope were here, um, I know that the Pope loves the Gospels and that for him, the encounter with Jesus comes through the gospel, which gives joy. So since I am a student of the scriptures, I will give you my book. <laughs> I will tell him, can we have time to have a little sharing on the scriptures? And I will give him the story of the Samaritan woman, because my book is on the gospel of Chani. And we will have a little discussion and hopefully he will have new insights because he does a lot of biblical interpretations in his writings, in his messages, but you just seem to miss that portion where he sees the, the, the women aspect coming in. And so um, if I were in Rome, I would ask if I can have a regular um, rendezvous with him once a week. <laughs> I was discussing the scriptures and start life like example what we just had, uh, what was given to us by Barbara and also by Vika. 
probably those kinds of orientation he will have to learn because you know I noticed our our um, clergy, the priests, they study the the scriptures, they study theology, but after they finish their studies, they don't study anymore. And they don't make up things anymore. And so therefore, they are left behind in the way they, they read the scriptures. So maybe that's what I will do, because that's also the gift that I have. So uh, let me first thank our speakers. Joan, please thank our speakers.